Hi, I'm Dan Cordopassi. Welcome to the SP Consist build. In this series, I'm working to make HO scale models of five locomotives that I saw in the front of a Southern Pacific freight train in Truckee, California in 1993. In the last episode, I finished weathering and detailing my Conrail SD40 number 6283. All that's left is to program the model's ESU Loc Sound 5 decoder. My goals for this time are to load a sound file into the decoder, assign function keys to control the lights and sound, and speed match the locomotive. To make sure I have the most up-to-date sound file, first I'll go to locsound.com to download it. I'll click the Downloads tab, then Sound Files, then Locsound 5 Family, and finally Locsound 5 North American and Australian Sound Files. There are still a lot of sound files to scroll through, so I'll search for SD40. It looks like the one on the top will work. This is a hi-fi sound set, which is good. A straight SD40 isn't in the list of appropriate locomotives, but that's probably an oversight. If this works for other 16-cylinder EMD 645-powered locomotives like the GP40, SD40A, SD40X, and SD40-2, then I think we're in the right place. ESU has a few different EMD 645 sound sets. This one says it has a single turbo early exhaust stack. ESU includes a lot of useful information here. This particular sound file was recorded from an SD40-2. It has a variety of horn sounds and several bell sounds to choose from. There's also other information about CV settings particular to this sound set. I'll click the download button, select SO508, which is the file number, and then accept to get past the legalese. I keep all of the Loc Sound 5 sound files that I've downloaded so far in their own folder. Before using the Loc Programmer software, I need to set up my workspace. I have my laptop, the Loc Programmer unit, some track, and of course the locomotive. The Loc Programmer plugs into one of my computer's USB ports. The track is connected to the track out on the Loc Programmer. From inside the Loc Programmer software program, I'll open the sound file that I downloaded. It's this one. Before I do anything, I'm going to resave the sound file. I'll add the locomotive's reporting marks to the end of the file name. I have a folder on my computer with saved files for all of my ESU equipped locomotives. These files store more than just sounds. They also have the locomotive address, all of the function key assignments, lighting effects, and anything else that can be saved into the decoder's CV registers. Saving a file for each individual locomotive ensures that I won't overwrite anything in the master sound file that I downloaded from the website. It's also a way to back up the decoder. If the decoder ever needs to be reset for any reason, I can restore it easily using the data file on my computer. One of the most fundamental things to program in a DCC decoder is the locomotive's address. Any number over 128 is a long address. I'll click that option and then set the address to my locomotive's road number 6283. Clicking on the Write Decoder Data button near the top of the screen writes to the decoder. The first time you write anything to a new decoder, more often than not, the Loc Programmer app will update the decoder firmware. You don't necessarily have to do things in a particular order, but before I go too far, I want to install the sound file that I downloaded. I'll click Write Sound Data. Writing sounds to the decoder may take a while. In my case, it was over 45 minutes. Thankfully, this one only needs to be done once unless you want to change the sound set in the future. This will also write other data to the decoder, so if I hadn't already assigned the address, it would do it now. The data file has some lighting functions pre-assigned, but it's not quite right for this engine. Setting them up involves configuring each lighting output and then assigning the outputs to function keys on the DCC controller. I'll start by going to the Function Outputs tab to configure the outputs. I wired the number boards on this engine to AUX1, so I'll change the name of AUX1 to Number Boards. I really like how this software allows you to give the lighting outputs meaningful names. I'll also change the light type to dimmable headlight fade in and out. This makes the lights come on more gradually, which to me looks more like an incandescent bulb turning on. LEDs come on too fast to look right to me. Since the number boards don't need to be super bright, I'll also turn down the brightness using the slider. I'll change the name of AUX2 to front class lights. Since none of the lights on this engine need to blink, I'll set the light type for these and all the rest to dimmable headlight as well. ESU decoders have quite a number of excellent lighting effects, but I don't really need them for this particular locomotive. AUX3 becomes the cab light. I'll rename AUX4 to rear class lights. And finally, I'll rename AUX5 for the ground lights. Naming all of the lights first will make it a little easier to figure out the next step. I'll click the save icon to save the file. 
Note that this is only saving the file to my computer, not writing data to the engine. Most of my HO scale equipment fits into my chosen 1990s era. That decade was a transition period for locomotive lighting. Some of the locomotives were being manufactured or retrofitted with ditch lights. Some still had beacons. A few SP engines even kept their original oscillating lights and emergency lights. While I loved the variety, I realized early on that I needed a way to control all those lights with DCC that made sense. I have way too many engines to try to remember which function keys do what for each one. So I came up with a standard. I based my standard on common practices like using F0 for the headlight and F6 for ditch lights. Some of my other function key assignments are my own convention. My idea is that when I finally get my layout built, I can create some kind of a cheat sheet, like a laminated card or maybe something hung on the layout fascia that explains the key assignments. That way, visiting operators should be able to control the lights in the locomotive they're using without too much trouble. I should mention that not all the function keys will always be used. Not all of my locomotives have all these different lights. My model of Conrail 6283, for example, has no ditch lights. That means that on this engine, F6 will do nothing. That is a waste of a key in a way, but I'd rather do that than have every engine be different and therefore confusing. I should also mention that my preference is for sounds and lighting effects that are actually important to routine operation. In other words, things real railroaders would need to control while operating a train. Examples would be the headlights, bell, horn, dynamic brakes, oscillating lights, ditch lights, and marker lights. Modern sound decoders can do a lot of other sound effects, but for me they're more for ambiance. Manually controlled diesel radiator fan noises or fireman Fred coal shoveling noises for cold fired steam locomotives would be examples. I don't really care as much about those kind of noises, so I don't worry too much about assigning them to low numbered function keys. For example, until very recently I had no engines with ground lights, so I didn't need to worry about that. I had to change it a little to make a slot for those. I'll go to the function mapping tab to start setting things up. The headlights, horn, and bell are fine the way they are, so I'll skip to F3. I don't use the coupler clank noise. I prefer the short air let off sound, which I sometimes use to simulate an air test after coupling. I'm not sure how prototypical that is, but it's what I'm using for right now. The left column shows the function keys. Each key can be assigned to a physical output like a light, a logical function, or a sound. I'm going to change the sound for F3 to short air let off. F4 is already dynamic braking. I want to keep that, but I don't want my locomotives to change speed while in dynamics, so I'm going to uncheck the brake function. I'd rather control the speed with the throttle. I use F5 for drive hold, which is a logical function. This is the Locksound full throttle feature. My Digitrax controller is set up to be able to trigger F0 through F29, but using anything above F12 requires some extra button pushing. That's why I prefer to put the most used functions on lower numbered keys. F6 is for ditch lights, which this engine doesn't have, so I'll uncheck everything. F7 is for marker or class lights. This key is set up for flange squeal, which I need to disable. It's currently set to only work if the locomotive is moving. I'll change driving to ignore, which means that the output won't be dependent on the locomotive's motion. Then I'll disable the flange squeal sound. I want to be able to operate the front and rear red lights independently though, so I'm only going to assign the front class lights to this key. Finally, I'll set the physical output to front class lights. This is where it comes in handy to be able to name the lighting outputs. For me anyway, it's a lot easier to remember front class lights than a number. There are a number of entries for F8, all having to do with turning the sound on and off. I'll leave these alone. I'm not going to use F9 for this engine, so I'll disable everything for this key. F10 is a key that I would use for the rear oscillating light on an SP engine or some other secondary auxiliary light in the rear. For this engine, I'm going to use it for the rear class lights. I'll disable F11. F12 is already set up as the headlight dimmer, so that's fine. I use F13 as a headlight override. Pressing it will keep the front headlight on regardless of the direction of travel. This is another reason I like ESU decoders. You can assign multiple keys to the same outputs, which is sometimes useful. Likewise, I'll use F14 as a rear headlight override.
F15 will be unused on this model. I'll leave F16 alone for right now. For F18, I'm going to change the function to not. That means that the action will be triggered when the F18 key is not pressed. I'll put the ground lights on this one. That means that the ground lights will be on by default and only turn off if I want them to turn off. I'll do something similar with the number boards on F19. I want them to be on most of the time. Skipping back to F17, I'm going to use that for the cab light. This is a light that probably won't need to be used very often, so I'm okay with having it on a higher numbered key. Let's use the Loke Programmer's Driver's Cab feature to try things out. After trying things out, I decided to go back and dim the number boards, cab light, and ground lights even more. So far, so good. I have a lot of sound-equipped locomotives. I like the horn to be loud, because real train horns are loud, and the horns aren't all in use at the same time. The diesel prime mover noises, though, can get annoying if there are too many diesels in the same area. Since I have so many sound-equipped models, I like to turn down the prime mover sounds. I try to think of it in terms of the real world. You might hear a train horn from a mile away or more. You're probably not going to hear an idling diesel unless you're fairly close to it. If you scale those distances down to HO, then it makes sense for the prime mover to be relatively quiet. To adjust volumes, I'll go to the Sound Slot Settings tab. While I'm at it, I'll adjust a lot of the other volumes. I'm not even sure what some of these are for, and some of them may not get used, but I'd rather have them down low just to be safe. I may need to tweak the volumes of some of the sounds later, but this is a good starting point. Doing some research, I found that the most likely horn sound for this locomotive is a Leslie S3. I'll set the horn sound by setting sound CV9 to 1. I got this number by referencing the information for this sound file, which is on the website, and also repeated inside the Loke Programmer software. To finish off the programming, I need to speed match the locomotive. I speed match all of my engines to the same standard so that I can operate them in any combination I want. Before matching speed, it's a good idea to dial in the motor control. I'll start by using the Loke Sound Auto-Tune feature. I'll set CV54 to 0 using my throttle, then exit programming mode and hit F1. The locomotive should move for a short distance and then stop. After two attempts, I wasn't happy with the results of the auto-tune, so I started tweaking the motor control CVs myself. It smoothed out the low-speed control, which was a little jerky at first. I ended up setting CV2, which controls the minimum voltage, to 2 so that the locomotive will start moving very slowly at speed step 1. I always set this CV as low as possible so that the locomotive is just barely moving but not jerky when the throttle is on 1. I use simple 3 speed step tables for my locomotives using CV2, 5, and 6. As I just mentioned, 2 is the minimum, 5 is the top end, and 6 is the middle. I never really needed to do anything fancier to get my locomotives to operate well together. I use one of my engines as the master locomotive, in this case this unassuming SPGP35. I match every other locomotive I have to this one. I'll start by putting both engines on a temporary track set up in our work-in-progress game room. I'll set up a simple consist so that the GP35 SP6587 is the second locomotive and Conrail 6283 is the lead locomotive. Because my speed settings are usually much slower than the default decoder settings, I'll put the SD40 in front. The engines are not coupled. There should be a little distance between them. I'll advance the throttle to maximum. Now I'll just watch the models for a while. As expected, the Conrail engine is faster. The Loksound 5 decoder defaults to a value of 255 for CV5. This CV controls the maximum voltage sent to the motor when the throttle is wide open, or at 99 on my Digitrax controller. I'll start by reducing this using Ops Mode or Programming on the Main to set CV5 and the Conrail engine on the fly. It's easier to see what's happening when the engines aren't too far apart. Sometimes I'll hold one back until the other catches up. Then I'll watch the distance between the locomotives. When the speeds are matched, they should stay more or less the same distance apart for long periods of time. I ended up with a value of 132 for CV5. Now that I've set that, I'll reduce the locomotives to half throttle and use the same procedure to set CV6. Since I like a nice linear speed curve, the value in CV6 should be around half that of CV5. I ended up with a value of 64, which is a little less than half. The math doesn't always work out exactly, but the important thing is that the Conrail engine is now matched with the SP engine. I also like to match the momentum settings saved in CV3 and CV4. CV3 controls the acceleration while CV4 controls deceleration. 
Since these are based in time, in theory you should be able to always use the same values for these CVs based on your preferences. In practice though, I like to make sure the locomotives are doing what I expect. I'll start from a stop and crank the locomotive to maximum. Then I'll watch the locomotives. The Conrail engine is getting up to speed faster, so I need to increase the value in CV3. I'll set the deceleration the same way. With the engines running at full throttle, I'll turn the controller knob back to zero. The Conrail engine stopped before the SP engine, so I need to increase the value in CV4. I ended up with a value of 24 for CV3 and 22 for CV4. I like deceleration to be a little quicker so that the train can stop faster if it's an emergency. Once I'm done with that, I'll couple the engines together and give them a run to make sure that they play nice with each other. This is just one method of doing speed matching that works for me. My engines are generally set to run slower than the prototype locomotives are capable of running. I don't have a scale speedometer, but I timed it once and they top out around 40 scale miles per hour. That's fine with me since our layouts tend to be much shorter than real rail lines, so running the trains a little slower makes the layout seem bigger to me. The last step is to put the engine back on the programming track and read the values back into the decoder. Once that's done, I'll save the file to my computer. Now I have a backup of the locomotive settings, including the speed settings, in case I need it in the future. If I end up tweaking any of the CVs later on, I'll do this again so that my backup file stays current. Looking at the screen, I can see my speed table and other settings. If you have more than two or three locomotives, I would highly recommend coming up with a standard scheme to set up your DCC function keys. While some function key settings have become fairly standard, many others are not. They often vary from manufacturer to manufacturer. If all of the locomotives are set to the same scheme, then it should be easier for both you and visiting operators to remember which keys do what. Using the Loc Programmer software and creating individual files for each locomotive is very useful. It doesn't happen often, but I have had locomotives go brain dead on me where the decoder just stops responding and nothing works. Usually a reset is required. If I didn't have a backup file, I'd have to go figure out all the lighting, sound, and motor control programming again. With a backup file, it's easy to put things back the way they were. I just put the engine back on the programming track and rewrite the decoder data. It takes a little more effort, but I think it's well worth it to speed match all the locomotives to the same standard. That way they can be run in any combination. I like to mix things up and not always run the same consists, so it makes sense to me to do things this way. Now my Conrail engine is truly finished, so next year I'm going to start working on the Cotton Belt V30-7. Stay tuned and thanks for watching.